Hello everyone. Hope you're all doing well. I'd like to welcome you again to our worship service today. It's February 21, 2021. And uh, today is, or this week is the first week of uh, Lent. And we are in the season of Lent preparation or Easter preparation. So, <clears throat> um, we're getting uh, ready for uh, Easter and uh, Good Friday and uh, the Resurrection. So today we will have um, the message to be given by Calvin and he has a very interesting topic to cover. It's about second chances. So uh, looking forward to that. For our worship service, uh, our worship songs, we are going to have um, Arise, King of Kings, followed by Praise to the Lord Almighty, and then uh, we will close with I Surrender All. And we will, as usual, have the uh, Speaking of Life, uh, this time by uh, Greg Williams. <clears throat> I'd like to share a prayer request from Gene. I just got uh, his email this evening, and he's asking for prayers. <clears throat> excuse me. He's asking for prayers for his brother Glenn, who has a uh, lung tumor, and he's scheduled to have a surgery to remove the tumor on March 5, and it's going to be a laparoscopic uh, surgery. And uh, we are asked to pray that this laparoscopic surgery will be successful so they don't have to go to the more uh, serious uh, surgery, which is to open, um, open up That's a major surgery. Um, so let's pray for him about that. And also I'd like to pray for our... Um, all the people who are suffering in Texas because of the uh, winter storms that went through that area and also in Louisiana and neighboring states. It's uh, sad to see the uh, difficulties that people had to go through. A lot of them lost their lives and uh, <clears throat> it's like an unexpected to see that happening in America. So we are sorry for those people but we are also um, glad to see a lot of good hearts uh, and uh, uh, the service that many people are doing for their neighbors and it's good to see those news also about uh, people helping each other so uh, let's pray for those people as, as well as uh, for those who are still affected by the pandemic um, as you probably all know, the uh, infection rate is uh, going down and uh, the vaccination is uh, getting better, although we still are short in supply of the vaccines, but it's, uh, it's, it's looking better in the near future. So for those who have been vaccinated already, congratulations. Um, we. Uh, just continue to pray and just continue to be careful and hang in there and uh, we will get back to normal very soon. Okay, <clears throat> with that uh, let's, uh, let's pray and uh, give, give thanks to God. Dear Lord, our Savior, um, our Father in Heaven, Holy Spirit, we just come before you Lord for uh, this wonderful time again to thank you to praise you Lord for our opportunity that you've given us to to uh, worship you and just to be together in spirit thank you Lord for each other for our brothers and sisters thank you for our denomination and our leadership and thank you Lord for the body of Christ all over the world for wherever well, two or three are gathered in your name you are there and we thank you that uh, 
your light still shines in the darkness or um, is still uh, doing the work of love wherever your people are so we thank you Lord for this wonderful news as um, we continue to trust in you and surrender our lives to you we just pray Lord for uh, Jean's brother Glenn <clears throat> who is going to have a surgery two weeks and um, we pray, Lord, that the laparoscopic surgery will be successful. Please be with him and the surgeons and medical um, people who will be uh, helping uh, Glenn with his surgery. And we pray, Lord, for the people who are affected by the uh, winter storms in the um, south and uh, in the neighboring states of Texas. Lord, we pray, Lord, for uh, your your intervention in the lives of many people who are suffering right now and we thank you for those who are serving and giving uh, what they have and sharing what they have to the others so Lord we pray Lord for for the uh, people who are affected by the vaccine or by the uh, <clears throat> virus again and we thank you for the vaccines and the uh, uh, improvements in the uh, uh, infection rate so we thank you Lord that we can uh, have hope in the near future that all these will uh, be in control and uh, we will go back to normal so we thank you Lord for that and we uh, thank you for um, just the growth that we ex experienced and uh, the closeness to what we, we've gone through through these um, as we went through these pandemic and are still going through so Lord, we thank you once again for this service, and we just ask you now to <clears throat> bless uh, everyone, and especially our uh, senior members, and those who are sick and uh, are in need of comfort right now. So we thank you, and we praise you, Lord, and we give you thanks in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And before our worship songs, I'd like to read from Psalm 25, verses 1 to 7. In you, Lord, my God, I put my trust. I trust in you. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let me, my enemies triumph over me. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame, but shame will come on those who are treacherous without cause. Show me your ways, Lord, teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you, Lord, are good. Amen.
Do you remember the first time you saw a rainbow? Rainbows are iconic, universal, showing up in legends and stories throughout history. Despite years of pollution and our increasingly busy lives, rainbows still make us stop and look up. The first recorded rainbow appears in Genesis 9, just after the flood recedes. Noah walks out into the steaming earth and hears the voice of God. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. This is what is called by theologians the Noahic Covenant, one of several agreements that God made with Israel and by proxy all the world. And here we see this strange imagery of the rainbow. I have set my bow. This word bow is the same Hebrew word as the bow of battle. To the original readers, the bow would have been a common sight in battle. It meant war and death. But for God to set his bow meant that war was over, that the struggle was over. This is the sign of the rainbow in the clouds, turned away from us a bow at rest. That rest is what we remember when we see it, and it reminds us of all of life. As violent as the storm might be, the rainbow will be there. The power of the thunder and the rain turns to beauty and color. That's all that's left standing. The covenant reminds us that a devastation like a flood won't destroy us again. God will not destroy us and start over. He will work with us and through us to accomplish redemption. He works through each storm in our lives to make beauty and light come through. Instead of ending history, he works within it. And instead of starting over with humanity, he became one. He set his bow in the sky. He set his covenant that he will always work with us and within us on our relationship with him. Let's remember this promise when the storm comes. I'm Greg Williams, speaking of life. Well, once again, you notice my background has changed. It's not the scene of my typical office, but it's a theme picture that's related to the presentation that I have today. And the picture depicts a new heaven and new earth. And the beautiful, bright structure behind me is the New Jerusalem, or sometimes referred to as the Holy City. The message that I have today is more of a question than anything else. It's a question that you, you and I have asked each other. It's a question that we've thought about ourselves from time to time. And the question is, is there salvation after death? Can a non-believer go from the gates of hell all the way up to the gates of heaven? after death. I wanted to mention that the presentation is based on an article that I read by Michael Morrison of GCI and that article is called Can People Get Out of Hell? So let's look at some scriptures that most Christians believe show that there is only one chance and the only chance that you have is when you're alive. And then we'll look at some other scriptures that perhaps indicate that there is a second chance after death. So can people get out of hell? That's the article that this presentation is based on. First, let's, let's look at Hebrews chapter 9. In verse 27, it says, Just as people are destined to die once, and after that, to face judgment. 
In other words, what this particular verse is saying that for the non-believer, the decisions that you make while you're alive are going to be judged by Christ after you die. The question is, is this judgment irreversible? In verse 28, it says, So Christ was sacrificed once to, be, to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Verse 28 contrasts against verse 27. Verse 27 is in reference to the non-believer, and the non-believer will be facing judgment after he dies. Whereas in verse 28, it's talking about the believer. And when Christ yeah. returns, he's going to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Now, according to Mike Morrison, this is the question he poses. He says, might it be that some of, this, some of these people are waiting have not met Jesus personally, but will welcome him with a heart of repentance after they see him at the time face to face? Will they have a change of heart? That is the question that Mike Morrison poses. So the general belief, as I mentioned, is that verses 27 and verses 28 is that you only one you only have one chance and the chance is now and it's not going to be available to you after death now let's look at verse 29 of john chapter 5. This is similar to what we saw in Hebrews. In verse 29 of, of John chapter 5, it says, And they will come out of the graves. Those who have done what is good will experience a resurrection to life. So the believer, when they get resurrected, they'll be resurrected to eternal life. Whereas, this latter part of this verse says, And those who have practiced evil will taste the resurrection that brings them to condemnation. Once again, this verse, or these two, this verse, implies that the only chance that you have for eternal life is now. But what about this condemnation? Is this con condemnation irreversible? Can it be changed? Mike Morrison poses this question, is there no further hope for them in the lake of fire? And also let us look at the story of the rich man and Lazarus contained in Luke 16. We will, since you know the this particular parable, we're going to go through this rather quickly. Verse 22 says, One day poor Lazarus died, and the angels of God came and escorted his spirit into paradise. Verse 23, The day came that the rich man also died. In hell he looked up from his torment and saw Abraham in the distance, and Lazarus the beggar was standing beside him in the glory. So the rich man shouted, Father Abraham, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip his finger in water and come to cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames of fire. Verse 24 
seem to indicate that this rich man is in the lake of fire. The lake of fire comes after the great white throne judgment, after the, the unfaithful are resurrected and thrown into the lake of fire as a final judgment. In verse 25, it says, But Abraham responded, My friend, don't you remember? While you were alive, you had all you desired, surrounded in luxury, while Lazarus had nothing. Now Lazarus is in the comforts of paradise, and you are in agony. Verse 25 again implies that you had your chance while you were alive, and you ignored that chance. And it also implies that now that you're dead, you don't have a second chance. And verse 26 seems to reinforce that belief. It says, besides, between us is a huge chasm that cannot be bridged, keeping anyone from crossing from one realm to the other, even if he wanted to. Verse 26 certainly implies that you cannot go from the lake of fire into heaven, even if you wanted to. Verse 27, so the rich man said, then let me ask you, Father Abraham, to please send Lazarus to my relatives. Tell him to witness to my five brothers and warn them not to end up where I am in this place of torment. Abraham replied, they've already had enough warning. They had the teachings of Moses and the prophets and they must obey them. Once again, implying that the rich man, as well as his five brothers, have every opportunity to respond to Christ while they're alive. Verse 30 says, But what if they are not listening? The rich man added. If someone from the dead were to go and warn them, they would surely repent. Abraham said to them, If they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, neither would they believe even if someone was raised from the dead. This parable seems to reinforce, once again, the general belief that the only opportunity for salvation is the here and now. Because the Jews had Moses and and the prophets. But what if you were not a Jew at that time? What if you were a Gentile? Could this mean that the, at least the Gentiles could have a second chance after death since they did not have Moses and the prophets? Let's step back a little bit and take a look at Revelation and some of the significant events that will happen in the future. As you know, there will be a great tribulation and that tribulation will be headed up by a false prophet, a worldwide false religion. And there will also be a worldwide political leader that's often referred to as the beast. Both the false prophet and the beast will be heavily influenced by Satan. In fact, I'm sure they will be demonized by Satan. At the very end of the tribulation, however, Christ returns. And there's the so-called battle of Armageddon where Christ easily defeats Satan and his hordes. The false prophet and the beast will be thrown into the lake of fire, but Satan will not. He will be chained into the bottomless pit or the abyss where most or all the demons are at. At 
after Satan is chained, there's going to be a 1,000 year millennium on earth where there's be a, a utopia, you might say. And there'll be no more death, no more pain. And Christ will reign for a thousand years. After the end of the thousand years, Satan will be released. And once again, he's going to convince many millions of humans to turn against Christ to attempt to overthrow Jesus Christ. But of course, that can't happen. And once again, Christ defeats Satan. This time, Satan will be and his hordes of demons, as well as those that went along with Satan, will be thrown into the lake of fire. After that, there is the great white throne judgment, where there's a general resurrection of the dead, the non-believers will be judged and thrown into the lake of fire. And the believers, of course, will be with Christ. After that, we have God creating a brand new heaven and earth and also a brand new Jerusalem or the Holy City. Let's take a closer look at the events in the latter times after, or I should say starting with the great white throne judgment and the lake of fire. In Revelations 20, it says, Then I saw a great dazzling white throne, and the one who sits on it, heaven and earth fled from, the, from his presence, and they were no more. I saw the dead, the lowly and the famous alike, standing before the throne. Books were opened, and then another book was opened, the book of life. The dead were judged by what they had done as recorded in the books. Here we find a new heaven and new earth. The old heaven and earth have passed away. And Christ is going to resurrect all that have died and those that are in the book of life will be with Christ. It says here in verse 12, the dead were judged by what they had done. This is in reference to what they had done while they were still alive. Verse 13 gives us a little bit more detail here. And the sea gave up the dead souls that were in it. The death and the underworld gave up the de their dead and were judged according to what they had done. Again, based on what they had done while they were alive. That's the general understanding. Verse 14, then death and the realm of the dead were cast into the lake of fire. For the lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not recorded in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Let's now look at the new heaven and earth as described in Revelation 21. Revelation 21, starting in verse 1, says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Verse 2, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. 
And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. So this new heaven and new earth, as well as the new holy city, is going to be something fantastic, something that we've never experienced before on this old earth. For example, look at the size of the new Jerusalem. It's going to be 1,400 square miles, which is, is approximately half the size of the United States. And that is just one city. It's going to be even 1,400 miles high, which means that the new earth and the new heaven is going to be governed by totally new laws of physics. I think the laws of physics on this earth, or on this old earth, would be challenged if we could even imagine building a city 1,400 feet, 1,400 miles high. Let us look at verse eight. This is an interesting verse. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, mm -hmm the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Verse 8 is generally, again, believed to mean those that are living the here and now, or at the time when Revelations was written. It's generally referring to those non-believers that are alive when this book was written, the book of Revelations. What if it can also mean that these people, these murderers, those that practice magic uh, arts, liars and so on are in reference to them being in the lake of fire and not so much of when they were living in the past. That would indicate that the new heaven and earth is coexisting with the lake of fire. It's not part of the new heaven and earth, but is coexisting outside of the new heaven and earth. Does that make sense? Let's go on. Now we're going to look at some details of the new Jerusalem and see if we can gain some insight on the question of, is there a second chance after death? In verse 25, it says, On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night. This is in reference, of course, to Jesus Christ, who would be the natural light for the new Jerusalem. Mike Morrison asks us this, is this an indication that those outside, those consigned to hell, are able to enter in? That is, if there is a change of heart. So the gates are always open. There will always be light shining out through the gates. And Mike Morrison is asking, those outside the gate, meaning those that are in the lake of fire, if there is a change of heart, can they enter?
Revelation 24, I'm sorry, 22 verses 14 says, Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may go through the gates into the city. Once again, the general belief is, is that it's talking about Christians who were alive and have washed their robes, meaning they have accepted Christ as their Savior before they died. But could it also mean that those in the lake of fire could conceivably have a change of heart and have their robes washed and then go through the gates into the city? So this is the question. Could it also include those who, after the great throne judgment, have a change of heart and be cleansed? Let's look at Revelations 22:17. I believe this is an important verse. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come! And let the one who hears say, Come, let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who wishes to take the free gift of water of the water of life. This scripture, verse 17, is generally believed to be an imitation of those that are alive now, those that are hearing the word of God. And the Spirit of God is asking for everyone to come. But notice, it says, the Spirit and the Bride. And also, verse 17 is in the present tense, not the past tense. So the Spirit, in reference to God the Spirit, the Father, the Holy Spirit, as well as Jesus Christ, and the Bride. The bride is, are the people, the believers, that are already living in the new Jerusalem, in the new earth, in the new heaven. And, and together they are saying, come, come, let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes to take the free gift of water of life. So you wonder if this Verse 17 is just referring to a general imitation of those that were living on the old earth. Or could it mean that it's in reference to those that were in the lake of fire during the time of the new heaven and earth? Because it doesn't make sense that he's referring to the to the present earth the old earth because the bride is already with christ in new in the new jerusalem so if we take the word as it is written both christ and the believers in the new jerusalem are somehow inviting those non-believers during the time of the new heaven and earth to come and enter into the gate. Let's see what Mike Morrison has to say about this. Morrison says, there is some scriptural leeway allowing for the possibility of a post-mortem post-resurrection, post-final judgment change of heart. If that is the case, should we then see hell as having some sort of cleansing educational value? Will some who in the general resurrection repudiate the forgiveness and acceptance they have with God in Christ in hell change their mind 
and enter through the open gates in the holy city. Mike is indicating that perhaps the lake of fire where there is torment could have some cleansing and educational value. It could change the hearts of some people that allow them to enter into the New Jerusalem. Mike Morrison also indicates that he is not advocating universalism. In, a, in other words, he does not believe that everyone in the lake of fire is going to have a change of heart. But he believes that there could be some that will have a change of heart and there is a second chance for those who do have a change of heart. Sometimes you wonder if there is a second chance after death, why wasn't scripture clearer about this? And I think we know the answer. Christ wants us to accept him now. Now that we're still allowed. If we knew that we had a second chance after death, what do you think we would be doing? Well, knowing human nature, we would wait. We would procrastinate. We would do everything we want to do in this life to satisfy our own selfish goals, you might say. And then, since we know we have a second chance while we're dead, that's when we'll perhaps have a change of heart. But that's not God, what God wants. He wants us to have a change of heart now. We know that God is love, he's full of mercy, he's full of grace. And it is his desire to have everyone come to Christ. And perhaps after death, those that didn't really have a true chance will have a change of heart and accept him and enter into the new Jerusalem. So there seems to be hope for those that have not accepted Christ after they have died. So that's the good news. Amen.
benediction the amazing grace of the master jesus christ the extravagant love of god the intimate friendship of the holy spirit be with all of you amen <music>